Corresponding fellows. Yeah. All foreigners are corresponding fellows. Okay. So it's a literal sense of the word corresponding. In the Russian Academy of Sciences, it's just the inferior stage. There are Schleber Correspondente, then they become full members. But in the British Academy, this is not the case. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Valentina Smirleva, and I have the pleasure of opening this uh, meeting um, and welcome um, my colleague and friend, Professor Sergei Ivanov, um, for a rare appearance at Columbia. We are uh, enormously grateful and excited to have uh, Professor Ivanov with us. Um, he is um, perhaps the, I would say, the, the most distinguished uh, Russian uh, Byzantinist. Uh, he graduated from Moscow State University in 1978 as a classicist and received a PhD in history in 84 with a study on the Byzantine historian Procopius of Caesar Caesarea and his accounts of the Slavs. And that shaped um, the tra trajectory of his of scholarship for um, the long um, last, um, which uh, has been focused on the relationship between Zambia and uh, of the Slavic people. His big doctorate uh, from the Russian Academy of Sciences in 1997, uh, 1997 um, was granted for his definitive study of the Byzantine polyphus a unique Eastern Christian category of sainthood, uh, which uh, was uh, also particularly, or has been particularly productive um, in Russia as well. Um, he has over 200 publications written and translated in over 20 languages, and has received numerous international awards, including a fellow, no, he's a fellow of the British Academy of Sciences, among his monographs are Holocaust in Byzantium and Beyond, Oxford University of the Press, 2006, Pearls Before Swine, Missionary Work in Byzantium, Paris, 2015, and uh, Byzantinska Kultura y Geografia, published in Moscow in 2020. As one of the most respected Byzantinists in the world, he also has the reputation of a popular historian and a columnist capable of communicating his vast academic knowledge and passion uh, to um, unspecialized broad audiences. His magnificently researched and elegantly written cultural guide of Byzantine Istanbul and its environs in search of Constantinople is a sheer pleasure to read and has already found readership in both Turkish and Bulgarian and is now uh, available in English. So uh, we'll find, no doubt, uh, Anglophone audiences as well. His um, lecture today is part of a long-term uh, research project focused on um, the, the great exodus of, from the Russian Empire across the Black Sea into Constantinople uh, in uh, the late teens and the uh, 20s of in the previous century. And um, as some of you know, um, this project has uh, generated several 
um, events, both at Columbia um, and also uh, in Europe, in Paris and in uh, Istanbul. And we are currently working on a, an exhibition uh, on the cultural encounters between Istanbul and uh, the refugees from the Russian Empire. Um, that is supposed to happen in the next several years. Uh, we are going, goes, uh, so again, and I will be um, going to Istanbul in a month uh, for an international symposium on the same uh, subject. Today, what um, he will talk to you about is um, a segment of a larger personal project about uh, the place of Constantinople in the Russian cultural imagination. The focus specifically on the encounter of the Russian refugees with the Byzantine monuments in Constantinople when they found themselves in the city in the early 20s. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Um, we are not very numerous in this audience. Uh, so before I finish this sentence, you will instantly know that English is not my native tongue. So please do not hesitate to interrupt me and ask questions if, you, if I pronounce something uh, so, so that you cannot understand me. When I began writing this paper, I could not imagine that I would find myself in the position of my characters. As soon as the war in Ukraine began, I fled, though not to Constantinople, but to Yerevan, leaving behind in my hasty flight my desktop computer with many pictures which I had been gathering for this presentation. Moreover, on my shelf in the Russian State Archive, still waiting for me, or maybe not anymore, repose many documents that remained unstudied. So the present paper is also a victim of this brutal and senseless war. This was an introductory warning. For centuries, Constantinople remained a source of envy, admiration, and competition for the vast expanses of Eastern Europe, known as Rus. Kyiv, uh, Vladimir, and Polotsk, out of rivalry with the great metrop metropolis of the Bosphorus, have been erecting their own Hagia Sophia. Um, for, uh, uh, in order to imitate Tsargrad, Kiev and Vladimir erected, built their own golden gates, competing with this one. Um, moreover, Constantinopolitan Hippodrome was depicted on the wall of the Kievan Hagia Sophia, although the main Sophia, the Byzantine one, was in staunch ideological opposition to the Byzantine Hippodrome, and they always remained irreconcilable adversaries. For Rus, these subtleties were unclear. Both church and entertainment looked equally prestigious and imperial. This is all is well known. Much less famous, but no less significant, is the following fact. In the 14th century, a monastery of St. Andronicus was founded in Moscow on the banks of a small nameless rivulet. Since the founding monk had spent a few years in Constantinople, he uh, playfully named this small stream Zlatoy Rajok, a small golden horn. The name persisted, and although the stream has been since enclosed in an underground, underground pipe and is no longer in sight, the street above it is still called Zolotaroshka, although nobody remembers where the name comes from. This simple fact is infinitely more important for our understanding of the image of Constantinople among the Rus than the so-called theory of Moscow, the Third Rome, an abstract messianic construct overblown and overestimated in much later epochs. After the fall of, of Byzantium, Constantinople remained an important and universal frame of reference. For example, when Afanasy Nikitin, 
a merchant who traveled from Tver to India, wants to describe to his reader the statue of the god Shiva in the Indian city of Parvan. He writes that it's like Justinian, the Tsar of Tsargrad, meaning the gigantic mounted statue atop the huge column which stood near the church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Obviously, this bronze Justinian embodied anything grandiose for the reading audience in Rus. During the Ottoman centuries, Istanbul was constantly, constantly visited by Russian pilgrims, merchants, spies, and diplomats. But even for the millions of Russians who never left their country, Hagia Sophia remained a symbol of Orthodox Christian spirituality. In the 19th century, when the rising imperialism of the Russian Empire began to dream of conquering Constantinople, the slogan, the cross must return to the dome of Hagia Sophia, became the battle cry for the foreign policy of St. Petersburg. In the second half of the 19th century, the first Russian tourists began visiting Istanbul. This century in general saw the birth of tourism more or less as we know it. Russia, with its gigantic distances and poor communications, lagged behind Western countries as far as tourism was concerned. concerned. But when the Russian tourists began traveling abroad, they always headed to the West. Constantinople remained largely the foremost destination for tens of thousands of pilgrims who were coming there for a day or two, got their documents and started their way to Jerusalem. Thus, Constantinople was in their eyes, a shadow of the Holy Land. They were co commonly shown around by monks and their interest in the city was exclusively pious. They normally visited Hagia Sophia, but otherwise they were looking not so much for Byzantine monuments, but for modern Greek Orthodox shrines, such as the Monastery of Life-Giving Spring, the Church of Laherna, and the Ecumenical Patriarchate. As can be seen um, uh, if in many diaries and notes of, of the printed in, by the by the pilgrims, these quasi-tourists did not distinguish between old and modern monuments, judging them exclusively by the degree of holiness. One pilgrim frankly writes in his diary, quote, the remains of the Byzantine past do not attract the pilgrims if, if the ruins were, were not connected with the sacred tradition, end quote. All pilgrims' reports are imbued with ardent hatred of everything Muslim. But even when secular tourists began visiting Constantinople at the beginning of the 20th century, this tourism was of a very strange sort. Nikolai Lekin, a popular satirist of the beginning of the 20th century, published a whole book in 1910 entitled On a Visit to Turks, a humorous description of a trip to Constantinople, which ridicules a fictitious Russian couple that comes to Constantinople. They fail to understand the very idea of tourism, reject all suggestions to show uh, this or that Byzantine monument. For example, they refuse to look at the famous uh, serpent, serpent column uh, in Constantinople because the woman is afraid of snakes. When the guide suggests to show them an underground cistern, the wife tells her husband that there is no difference whether they descend there or not, they can tell their friends upon returning back to Russia that they did. So all Russian language guides through Constantinople, which existed by 1913, were of clerical sort and were translated of modern Greek clerical publications. In 1913, the first Russian tourist guide of the true, in the true sense of the word was published in Constantinople. It's a romantic story. It was authored by two emigres, Korkmas and Skakowska. The former was a Dagestani aristocrat, the latter a Polish one. Both were Bolshevik emigrants in Paris. They met and got married in Paris in the early years of the 20th century. In Cartier Latin, the couple got acquainted with other political immigrants in France, some of them being young Turks. After the revolution of 1908 in the Ottoman Empire, former emigrants became ministers and invited their Russian friends, Korkmas and Skakowska, to Constantinople. The couple accepted the invitation. Korkmas and Skakowska, being Bolsheviks, 
founded the first trade unions in the Ottoman Empire and initiated the organization of a communist party there. Very soon, the Young Turks grew displeased with their activity and Korkmaz and Skakovska were advised to refrain from politics. This is how the couple came to the idea of writing the first secular guidebook through Constantinople. Neither of them was a specialist, but they were, they were well read in French literature. Their book is indeed a revolutionary one since it was written by two people, neither of whom had anything to do with the Orthodox Christian tradition. Korkmaz was raised a Muslim, Skakovska as a Catholic. Both were atheists and communists. So the mythology of the third Rome, the mystique of Hagia Sophia, all this was alien to them and their guide encompasses not only the majority of Byzantine monuments, but also the Ottoman mosques. Unlike all earlier Russian guides to Constantinople, they introduced the notion of cultural, not religious value. But it was published just on the eve of the Great War and was, uh, didn't, had no any, any circulation. The upswing of the patriotic feelings and imperialistic aspirations at the beginning of the Great War moved Hagia Sophia to the fore of the public attention. The lack of clarity concerning the goals of the war turned Hagia Sophia into the main symbol and the major prize for which rivers of blood were shed. Numerous publications appeared describing the uh, great church um, uh, and the, its mystical significance, which was declared meaningful exclusively for Russians. Scholars, clerics, artists, and politicians were seeking to excel each other in praising this church, was, which was no longer perceived as a mere building. The most characteristic in this respect is the brochure Hagia Sophia and Constantinople by Prince Evgeny Trubitskoy, um, which was translated into English language so that the allies would share our Russian emotions. The catastrophe of the 1917 changed the whole picture. Ivan Bunin wrote in his, uh, of his arrival in Constantinople uh, in 1920, I quote, in previous peaceful years, I have been to Constantinople many times. Now, as luck would have it, I got there for the 13th time and this fateful number was not accidental. In a crying contrast with the past, everything was extremely woeful in Constantinople." End the quote. Bunin was traveling together with his friend, um, a great Russian Byzantinist, Nikodim Kondakov, who had in the former days profusely published on the Byzantine monuments on Constantinople. It seems that Kondakov could serve as a best tour guide for Bunin, but it did not happen. Obviously, for the old Byzantinist, Constantinople was no more. Bunin wrote in his diary, I quote, 21st of February, 1920, we came to the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, squalor and emptiness, end the quote. Hundreds of thousands of dispossessed and disoriented refugees who swarmed Constantinople in 1920, 23, had to rethink anew their life, their history, and even their faith. Some of them blamed the lack of religious faith among Russians for what happened. Among professional historians, Georgi Vernatsky shared this view. A right-wing politician, Vasily Shulgin, uh, wrote that uh, the immigrants torn from their own culture treated Constantinople is their culture's forefather. On the other hand, many people saw the root of their misfortune, misfortunes exactly in the Russian history. In a short story on Halki Island, Alexei Tolstoy describes an officer, Lieutenant Colonel Izumov, sitting in a state of deep distress on a small island in the Sea of Marmara near Constantinople, um, blaming the Russian obsession with Byzantium for the present tragedy. I quote, Byzantium made go to hell. So much for our Russian blood has been spilled, uh, of our Russian blood have been spilled for this damned Byzantium. It's the usual Russian stupidity all over again, end the quote. 
Yet, there was not only conservative nostalgia and its disenchanted rejection. It seems that the approach of the Russian refugees in Constantinople to the Byzantine past of the great city began to change in its quality as compared to the pre-revolutionary attitudes. This immediately resulted in the birth of real tourism. It looks improbable. The refugees should have been fully, fully concentrated on their struggle for survival. The vast majority of them were dirt poor. And yet, this is the fact. In 1919, a highly unlikely time for tourism market, the guidebook written by Korkmas and Skakowska was reprinted in Constantinople. They, but by that time, they, they both of them returned to Par pa pa Paris, then Korkmas came to, to the Soviet Union, became a very, very high-ranking official, and of course was shot in 1937. They divorced with Skakowska. Skakowska uh, became the Soviet spy in Poland, was arrested, sentenced to um, life in prison, then exchanged for somebody and returned to the Soviet Union, and sure enough, was shot in 1937. Uh, but their, their book was reprinted in Constantinople, not, not by them, but by, by some other people. But what is interesting, it was updated with inclusions of recent developments as late as 1918. It is very ironic that in that, that same, uh, this is, this is the, um, their guidebook. Mm, this is very ironic that in the same year, 1919, on the other side of the front of the bloody civil war, in the impoverished and hungry Moscow, uh, the Sabashnikov publisher printed the Russian translation of a secular French guidebook through Constantinople by Jalal Assad. This. Uh, it had been translated before the revolution. Later, the translator died of hunger. And yet something urged the publisher, Pyotr Sabashnikov, to print, who was spared by, by the Bolsheviks, by, by Lenin personally, to print the book. For whom, in all probability, for those who planned to flee from the Soviets. In 1921, another guidebook was published in Constantinople, Ruski v Constantinople, Le Rus a Constantinople. The refugees were organizing study trips around the city. The Duchess Zinaida Shachovskaya writes in her memoirs that her family attended excursions around Byzantine monuments. Such visits are mentioned in the memoirs of many refugees by Lyubov Belazerska, Pavel Dolgorukov, Dona Minada, et cetera, et cetera. The information about the, uh, those tours is corroborated by Fyodor Burtsev, an ordinary refugee from Armavir, um, uh, a warrant officer in the White Army, who left an extremely interesting unpublished diary of his two years in Constantinople kept in the Russian state archive. Burtsev shows great interest in Byzantine antiquities of all sorts. He finds a Byzantine mosaic, for example, in the dusty heaps of the Yenisaris Museum in Hagia Irini and treats it as a piece of art, not as a religious relic. But he's also thrilled, by the way, with old Ottoman monks. This is characteristic of the white immigrants. They showed interest not only in uh, Orthodox Christian monuments, but in the old uh, Muslim uh, shrines as well. Um, and um, the future father of American applied mechanics, Stefan Timoshenko, uh, describes his visit to Hagia Sophia, a company accompanied by history professor Fyodor Taranovsky, and writes that his appreciation of the monument was so deep exactly because he was given scholarly, accurate scholarly comments by a specialist. A white officer, Yuri Meir, writes in his memoirs. Now I give a bigger quote, quote. We turned into real tourists. In the merry company, we were touring Constantinople, beginning with Hagia Sophia. Of all the mosques, Ahmedia impressed me the most. Of course, all of us were complete 
neophytes. Because in our gymnasia, the history of Byzantine Empire, let alone the Ottoman Empire, was taught very superficially. What did we know? The Codex of Justinian, some information of the ecumenical councils, the heresy of Arias, Nestorians, iconoclasts, and the quote. So it's obvious that for Meir, the education that he had got in Russia was now looking too clericalized, and he now perceived Byzantium in a much lovely, uh, much livelier and more open uh, manner. Before the revolution, the Russian pilgrims were anxious to find in Constantinople underground Ay Ayazmata, that is holy springs, springs of holy water. But no, the Russian tourists wanted something secular. Capitalizing on this new interest, some entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial Russians opened a new Byzantine monument in the city, the Basilica underground cistern, now one of the main attractions of Istanbul. Not that its whereabouts were previously completely unknown, but it did not constitute a special point on the cultural map of the city. The Russian businessmen did not bother to be very accurate with historic dates, de details. They began publishing advertisements in the Russian newspapers, uh, they were repeating this ad over and over again. Mm, so they really reached the, I'm sure, the, the whole Russian community of Constantinople, uh, uh, in, um, in which uh, they darlingly daring, proclaimed this system to be the remains of the great palace of the emperors. Uh, Fyodor Burtsev wrote in his diary, I quote again, a group of Russian immigrants found an ancient underground palace and began to show it to public for money. Uh, a poster at the entrance explains that this, this palace was built by Constantine the Great, it was hidden under the earth and nobody knew about it. Only now it was found by Russians by chance and became accessible. A small door and stone stairs recently repaired led, lead there. The space is provided with electric lighting. So they they really did a job. Um, more precise information about, about this palace is still missing. For 600 years, it was these basements were concealed from public and from scholars. Our immigrants somehow managed to obtain the permission from the Turks to open this palace. End of quote. The Evocational People's University, which was opened by the refugee scholars for, for the Russian immigrants, was also very active in many respects and in this respect as well. Uh, the same Fyodor Burtsev writes in his diary, quote, spring 1922, the People's University organized guides tours, guided tours around the, pal the places of, of interest in Byzantine Constantinople conducted by our scholar, scholar and archeologist. Unfortunately, he doesn't give the name. First of all, we visited all the local secular museums which turned out to be very rich and wonderful. Um, I myself try, uh, try my best in, uh, to get acquainted with the city and its rich culture." End of quote. The pomposity and grandeur of the old image of Constantinople began to fall apart. It was giving way to different kinds of problematization. Writer Valery Levitsky was publishing in Zarnitsa new newspaper Impressionistics uh, impressionistic essays on the Byzantine monuments. The painters were rejecting the, uh, rejecting the old fashioned cl classicizing approach to these monuments. Alexis Grishenka, well, he, by then he, uh, he was identifying himself as Russian. He was, so he was Grishenka. Later on, later in life, he, he became uh, associating with him himself with the Ukrainian culture and be, became Grishenka. But by in early life, he, he, he obviously was uh, identifying himself as Russian. So Grishenka offered his new Kubist vision. This is Grishenka, Kubist vision of Hagia Sophia. Um, he he was he produced a lot of a lot of uh, pictures of Byzantine of Byzantine monuments. Lydia Nikanorova 
was making bold sketches uh, of mosaics and fresco of, of Horror Museum. Um, Varvara Roda, another young Russian immigrant painter, also depicted Byzantine monuments in a new manner. Photographer Vladimir Zender invented how to make um, uh, photographs of Byzantine art in such a way that they were marketable uh, abroad. Uh, in literature, uh, the old moth eaten imperial ressentiment was now contested by the mad fantasies of Ilyas, Ilya, Ilyas Danievich, the title. Um, the title of his um, novel, Philosophia, is an obvious play on words, philosophy and the love of Hagia Sophia. There, he both mocks the traditional imperialist view of the great church and offers new futuristic senses for it. What is of special interest for me as a Byzantinist is that the changed situation breathed new life into Byzantine studies. The famous Russian Archaeological Institute in Constantinople, closed in 1914, had been a very noble institution, but deeply colonialist in its approach to Turks. Russian academics working in, in Istanbul, like uh, uh, academician Fyodor Uspensky, uh, held the locals in fastidious contempt. But in the new circumstances, the Russians felt affinity with the Turks who also lost their war and were also deprived of their statehood. Nikolai Belayev uh, had been a heroic officer in the White Army in the Civil War. Finding himself in Constantinople without any means for survival, he worked as an unskilled laborer. But during those hard months, he fell in love with Byzantium. And in later years, he got a degree in history in Prague and became a prominent Byzantinist. Moreover, Byzantine Constantinople became the place and the topic that could bring together the two parties of the bloody and merciless civil war, and for the first time, make them try to understand each other. The young Soviet art historians, Nikolai Brunov and Vladimir Alpatov, sent to Istanbul by the th Soviet authorities, met with the last remnant of the Russian Archaeological Institute, Nikolai Kluge. While Viktor Lazarev, recently a soldier of the Red Army and now a Soviet scholar, made acquaintance with Dmitry Ismailovich, recently an officer of the White Army, who became a painter and copyist a very, um, very enthusiastic copyist of Byzantine mosaics. In the, pre uh, in the personal archive of Lazarev, there is a photo signed by Ismailovich to him uh, at the backdrop of a Byzantine fresco. So Byzantine legacy ceased to be an, an indisputable source of imperial legis legitimacy or a token of religious messianism and became a counterpart in the Russians new dialogue with the Byzantine culture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that the audience, both here and online, has a lot of questions. So um, I'm opening the floor. Um, there's nothing yet online. Um, Thank you so much uh, for, for such a lightning thing and also uh, amusing and hard uh, lecture. Um, I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit more about this episode that they uh, discovered Basilica and kind of repacked it in this new narrative. It's pretty hilarious, <laughs> I would say. Um, could you tell us a little bit more what it was? Before? Or in terms of narrative, uh, was it known to the public? And, mm -hmm. uh, what happened later? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Basilica cistern was many times described in Byzantine historical sources, was rediscovered very early in the 16th century um, of, um, by French, French scholars, 
exclusively from from written sources they they came to the place and they they found out that the locals uh were drawing water from some from, from underground and uh, but the the locals did not know what was there underneath so it remained remained a source of of fresh water for for many centuries but no nobody was very much interested in uh turning it into a uh, into a place of pilgrimage or entertainment. Uh, I uh, I'm friend with uh, um, uh, with a Turkish archaeologist who is specializing in uh, Constantinopolitan water supply. Uh, he defended his, dis his dissertation on it, and he's highly qualified for this. And I asked him uh when uh when did well any digs or excavations begin he said that yes there were no excavations but uh from time to time uh inquisitive people were just somehow crawling there uh through the debris and found that there was a huge huge place on under underground but indeed some it was the russians who opened it as a museum, sort of. Um, then, who were these Russians? I have no ways to, to, to find out. After Russians left Constantinople in 1923, uh, the system returned to its uh, derelict state. And uh, it was opened anew uh, in 1988. And since then is one of the three or four maybe the the most expensive entertainments of byzantine uh, istanbul and, and still is um but of course it took a lot of effort uh, of course so who were these entrepreneurial entrepreneurial uh, uh, russians uh, adventurers i don't know unfortunately few words here, but of you have to check with my uh, factual knowledge here. As far as I know, it wasn't as obscure as that. Indeed, under Abdulhamid II, there was a major respiration project done mm -hmm. to the system, and Abdulhamid reigned from 1876 to 1908. So it was on the agenda of the historic uh -huh. monuments of the city. How interesting! But how comes that it be it became or, or owned by some some adventurers? I am a, I am a historian of nineteenth century Istanbul, uh -huh. and I've never heard this story before. It's, uh -huh. uh, it may just be one of the significant rumors. How interesting! And that's lovely. I like that. But uh, I think uh, now I uh -huh. don't know enough facts about the restoration project. Mm -hmm. Who restored it? But if it is up to have it money mm -hmm. invested in it, it had to be pretty serious uh -huh. stuff. Oh, how interesting. Thank you so much indeed. Well, uh, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's check. It's all the more enigmatic because if it was known to the people, why, why somebody allowed the Russians to, to somehow to take hold of them? And you know, um, these historic buildings are not just allowed to turn into commercial views. So mm -hmm. we have to check this. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course, it's it's highly interesting. Uh, it definitely was not a museum, so uh, maybe it was. Uh, it was, yeah, it was researched, but not, not used for uh, for commercial purposes. And yeah, it it took Russian <laughs> refugees to to turn it into a sort of attraction. <laughs> <laughs> Wine bar. Mm. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Mm. And I have to say, yeah, it does right. look like a palace. I mean, it it's impressive yeah. with all these columns. And... Well, it's the water, the water. It's very strange that you can. Uh, <laughs> You can proclaim it a, a, a palace if it's it's covered in water, but well, maybe they thought that the water came later on. 
It looks, yeah. Otherwise, of course, hundreds of columns make it look like a sort of palace. Very, very actually normal palace because you have a flat stream of letters, so it looks even more impressive, more kind of gigantic yeah it it makes it made when it was desolate of course it made in a sort it was even more impressive when it, of course it was it was just empty and dark and that's why it was many times used in the, later on in the in the movies for example from russia with love uh, this famous james bond movie uh, james bond is also uh, sailing in a boat through this vast and dark space to to reach the soviet embassy which in fact is on the other side of the golden horn um, and some french for uh, some french movie also of the 60s uh, the the this space is also also filmed because it's very picturesque there is a question from an anonymous attendee online uh, and the question is, is it known how many Russians remained in Constantinople after the 1920s? Was there, is there still a Russian community, churches, etc.? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm not a specialist. I read that uh, the vast majority of them left in 1923 when Constantinople was returned to the Turkish Republic of Ataturk um, before his before his advent, it, it was a fit of hysterical fears among the Russians that they will be uh, all assassinated by, by the Republicans. Um, and the, the, the rumors of the atrocities committed in Izmir beforehand, of course, heated the atmosphere. So they were, they were uh, leaving in panic. When the Republicans came, they killed nobody, but very soon, they uh, ordered all those who remained to take Turkish passports. This was the this was uh, the point of no return. So nearly all of them left, save several thousand, which remained, and I must say played a very important role in many many walks of life in in republic of Republican Turkey. They launched the first. Turkish ballet, ballet dancing. They launched the first uh, boxing. They uh, uh, they launched sunbathing. Uh, they launched, uh, of course, modern arts of different kind. Uh, they they launched uh, haute couture and many other things, which for many decades remained nearly exclusively Russian. By, but these Russians had to take Turkish names, not only passports, but names. So in today's Constantinople, there are several families which have some traditions, probably some of them even speak Russian, um, but they, the numbers are negligible, very few. Part of the people who remained in the city mm. were either married to Turkish citizens mm -hmm. or to mm -hmm. Turkish citizenship themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the fears, by the way, was also that they will be extradited to, to, to the Bolsheviks, of course. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was mm -hmm. part of the. the and with, with good reasons, because Ataturk was in very good relations with the Bolsheviks. Of course, these fears were not completely ungrounded, uh, but they were not. They were actually, none of them was uh, extradited. And in terms of churches, there are, as far as I know, three uh, mm -hmm. Russian churches in, mm -hmm. uh, which are house churches. Mm -hmm. They're on the roof of those mm -hmm. And it's become very chic to take a tour of the mm -hmm. Russian churches. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. I, I understand that the, the tourism company is charging it again and on, but doing a very good tour of these churches. Um, in the, in the, the Russian community is small and shrinking. A lot of the old uh, yeah. families have died out. Mm -hmm. There are some newcomers who also settled uh, and they com constitute a community of their own. And even some of them invest some money in, in the 
the different well me memorial things uh, for example if i'm not mistaken they uh, rebuilt a monument to uh, the russian soldiers uh, killed in during the war of 1877-78 in san stefano uh, in the, uh, the outskirts of the of the historical uh, city um, which was blown up by 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 the ottomans in 1914 it was this was the, the and this was by the way the first turkish film uh, by the way russians launched also the the turkish movies um uh, first movies were made by by russians um so yeah nowadays of course uh, the all the vestiges of the first immigration all but a, disappeared but there are new newcomers who are also doing something and right now we have a new refugee oh, in the, a new day de definitely a new wave of refugees yes is swarming constantinople because turkey is yes it's very reluctant to follow the the western line of of sanctions against russia and so it's welcoming the the russian the Russians in, in whichever way. Any other questions? Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, you talked mainly about the um, sort of new vision of Constantinople in sort of the Russian historical imagination um, at this time, but in some of the materials that you were using, it's really striking how there were also um, all of these different artists from Russia arriving and using Constantinople as an inspiration for, for their own uh, sort of interests and aesthetics. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that mentioned cubism already uh -huh. uh, it's almost as if and some of the other images it seemed like some other currents like surrealism or or, um, or you know certain avant-garde constructive movements may have been active there as well i wonder if you could talk about that but it seemed like constantinople itself um not just as an emigrate uh, sort of site but also as a sort of uh, you know, an artistic um, you know this mecca or or opportunity for transplantation of all of the uh, artistic currents active in Moscow and Petersburg in the pre revolutionary, revolutionary, post revolutionary. Well, I'm not qualified. I'm not an art historian, not in the least. Uh, I know that there were many, they were numerous, and they constituted a, a society of their own uh, with a formal membership, with uh, 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 which was discussed by all the, the members. Uh, are they are they wanting to to welcome a new uh, new member um there were like like 30 uh, 30 members of this of this circle of this community and they organized exhibits in um in uh, their in the russian mayak club um and uh very often they were becoming famous among the circles of the occupying uh, allied forces mm, of, of British and French uh, officers and generals who were somehow advertising them in their respective countries. And then uh, big uh, art lovers from the States began coming um, and buying lots of their, of their drawings and in, in, inviting them. Uh, to exhibit in Europe and or to move, nearly all of them moved f very soon moved to, to Western Europe, predominantly to France, uh, like uh, like Nikanorova, mm, but some in different exotic directions. For example, Ismailovich finished in Brazil and became the father of Brazilian painting and is regarded uh, the father, founding father of Brazilian uh, Brazilian arts. Uh, he lived a very long life. He, he died in 1978, um, uh, very res deeply respected by everybody in Brazil. Uh, his painting manner somehow, somehow reveals, the, I would say, Byzantine influence until the very end I'm not sure if he was aware of this himself, but he, there is some tinges of, of Byzantine icon painting. Maybe this is why he was so, so, uh, he, he was so beloved by those who were uh, who, who wanted uh, him to to draw their their portraits. They all of them look a, 
a little like like icons, um, and and in other in other in other countries and in the United States as well. Um, uh, but um, I know Grishenko because he was especially interested in in Byzantine monuments. I don't know why. Uh, but probably because he, he he wrote so much later on. He he was advertising himself when when in France. Grishenko was was a specialist in um, icon orthodox mm -hmm. icons before he immigrated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so he came with significant knowledge about mm -hmm. the, the Byzantine tradition. But what happened? Uh, what I find absolutely fascinating about him is that he found. Uh, the Constantinople, Ottoman Constantinople, mm -hmm. as a, a, an inspiration, mm -hmm. no less than the Byzantine traces there. And for him, um, both the Russian tradition mm -hmm. and the Ottoman tradition uh, were to um, get to, to mm -hmm. branches of, mm -hmm. of the same Byzantine mm -hmm. uh, culture. Yes. So this commonality between Absolutely. the Ottoman, mm -hmm. uh, Muslim Ottoman culture mm -hmm. and Russian uh -huh. Orthodox culture is something that he brought with himself, uh, reflected in his paintings mm -hmm. and actively advertised among uh, mm -hmm. modernist Turkish mm -hmm. painters in leaving quite a bit of impact on Absolutely. on. Uh, people mm -hmm. like uh, Namak Ismail mm -hmm. and especially uh, Charlie. Um, mm -hmm. By the way, uh, yes, I yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, uh, in his diaries, um, they are very interesting, very interesting diaries. Um, he, he writes that he was absolutely thrilled with Ottoman miniatures in the Ottoman Museum. So it was absolutely a source of inspiration for him. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the Byzantine icons were not icons for him. He he regarded them as quite avant-garde kind of art. He was insisting that it's not something old-fashioned and moth-eaten. That uh, uh, Russian, uh, Russian, old Russian and Byzantine icons are just a non-realistic uh, art, which must be an inspiration for us uh, modernist uh, artists. And not something which is connected with, you know, um, uh, conservative and uh, re reactionary uh, art of the old Russian Empire. He was insisting on this even before the revolution. Yeah, he was writing about. You're absolutely right. He he wrote a special book about it. How 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 modernist is the um, medieval icon painting? It so it was be perceived as something absolutely absolutely avant-garde. <laughs> and I would say that the Turkish artists who came to know him were at first very appalled at his ideas because they just learned how to how to draw in classical manner. They just returned from, from Germany where they were taught how to write, how to do realistic realistic pictures. And now Grishenko comes and says that it's no no longer interesting. You should you should uh, you should learn to, to do something absolutely absolutely different. But finally he he managed he managed to convince many Turkish artists. One thing that uh, going back to Chris's question about this uh, Constantinople uh, at the time right a moment before it became Istanbul as a fertile ground for cross pollination that, okay, Grishenko had an influence on some of the Turkish modernists, but at the same time, the city left a lasting impact on his own uh, artistic imagination. And if he became a big name in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, where he left right after mm -hmm. um, he, he left the, the Constantinople, it was with his watercolors of, of mm -hmm mostly of Muslim mm -hmm. um, Istanbul than uh, mm -hmm. with his uh, visions of uh, mm -hmm. the Byzantine monuments. So, so there's, there's an interesting moment of influencing Ebrian, which 
every which direction. Mm -hmm. now, I would say that the openness towards uh, this oriental spirit of, of Istanbul is something that uh, definitely uh, was absolutely alien for, for the pre-revolutionary uh, Russian well, tourists or I would say uh, visitors. And it, it, became, it became very characteristic, characteristic of all the memoirists uh, of the Russian emigration. They, after being devoid of the imperial haughtiness, uh, being left without, uh, without uh, their own country, they, they became much more sensitive to, to the outer world. And they bega began to notice something which they did not notice. Because, well, when Bunin is describing Ist Istanbul before the revolution, it's, it sounds very condescending uh, towards the, the, the Turkish culture. Do you find the, the Russian fascination with um, Ottoman Istanbul um, to be a, a different variety than the Orientalist the Western uh, take on the city? There are some of uh, the same mm -hmm. Your protagonists are mm. very vocal against the Pierre Loti type of uh, mm. uh, portraying and, <laughs> and narrating the city. Um, oh, of course, oh, of course, this approach is Orientalist from the modern perspective, of course. And of course, uh, Korkmaz uh, and Skakowska are quoting uh, Pierre Loti all the time in there in the guidebook, of course. Um, but what is there is the idea of uh, of culture in general. I think that what is revolutionary in the in their guidebook is the idea that the value is the value of culture, not of religion. And this is extremely extremely important. And and uh, this becomes overwhelming among the among the the majority i would say of the of the white immigrants they 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 of course they came as orthodox christian believers but they see other things which previously they did not even notice for example for example well pilgrims come and of course they invariably go to the to the church of laherna uh, because uh, you know that the feast of Feast of Pakrov, the oh, excuse me, uh, the in intercession of the Veil of the Virgin, is um, one of the most beloved feasts within Russian Orthodox Church. But its implotment is with one Constantinopolitan church, that is Vlacherna Church. So each time the Russian pilgrims, by scores, by hundreds, were coming every day to this church of Vlacherna and were told that this is where this famous um, this famous miracle of the with the veil of the virgin took place exactly here so they were uh, they were um, making pilgrimage they knew where but only when white russians came as refugees they realized all of a sudden that for example that the local greeks know nothing about this miracle whatsoever that for greeks for constantinopolitans it's it's not a landmark at all this this church exists for russian pilgrims and they realize it only when they became not tourists not, not pilgrims but but well locals became they begin to live there in constantinople and they realized that probably it was a, a sort of fake fake pilgrimage place it was created for them by the greeks uh, to to take money from them but greeks them, themselves do not regard it as a as a shrine at all so lots of things changed in their mindset when they became this what desolate poor refugees in constantinople Specifically, the mosaics that were preserved in that church, which was of interest. To no, 
No, uh, there are no, no mosaics in this church. The church of Blacherna wa was burnt to ashes in 1436, uh, some years before the fall of Constantinople. So yeah, uh, so the Greeks just erected the church in the 19th century for the Russian pilgrims, more or less. Uh, yeah, you mean Kareya Jimmy, yeah. Uh, Kareya Jimmy was known, was very well known. Um, because the most wonderful mosaics were not uh, properly whitewashed by the Ottomans. So they were somehow visible, more or less visible through, through whitewashing for a long time. But it was the Russian, the Russian uh, scholars of, from the Russian Archaeological Institute who made the first, first recent scholarly research of these mosaics. Um, the very prominent scholar Fyodor, Fyodor Schmidt published a monograph in, in 1906 on, on horror. Um, and um, uh, yes, and pilgrims sometimes came there, uh, came there, but since this church was not connected to any fairy tales of the Russian religious folklore, they were not at all uh, uh, well inspired by them. And many, many pilgrims resented the fact that they were not taken there. But of course, as soon as the, the wave of Russian refugees came to Constantinople, many of them got interested in these mosaics and were copying them, many of them, both Nikanorova and, uh, and Rode and Ismailovich and several others were, were working in this, in, 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 this, in this mosque by then. By then it was mosque, then it became a museum. And now since 19... The 2020, it's a mosque again, and nobody knows what happens to the mosaics because nobody even entered this building since the moment it was reconverted as a mosque. So the scholarly world is just is just wondering what's happening inside. Maybe they are whitewashed again, or probably they are somehow covered with some, I don't know, with some curtains, but well, it's possible in, in Sofia, but in Kakhiye, Kariye, they are everywhere. So it's impossible to cover them. You have to cover the, the whole space. So nobody knows. And probably the, the Turkish authorities themselves do not know what to do with it because ideologically it was very important to proclaim the reconversion from museum back to mosque. But practically, probably they don't, they do not dare whitewash them again. Can we ask uh, about the role of some of the Russian refugees for the restoration of uh, the mm -hmm. Byzantine monuments, which became mm -hmm. uh, began in all earnest with the creation of the Byzantine Museum? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, yes. This is partially this. This story is not known. I made. I made a big reconnaissance uh, about the ex French excavations, uh, excavations uh, carried out by the uh, archaeological service of the of the French occupying forces. There was such a such a div archaeological division of the of the French occupying forces in Constantinople. I I did not manage to find any Russian names among the among those who were excavating, but uh, Nikolai Klugi, whom I mentioned in my paper, was immediately immediately uh, hired uh, by by the um, by by Whit Thomas Whittemore uh, when he got interested in Byzantine in Byzantine uh, monuments of Constantinople and worked until his death. Uh, he worked for, for Whittemore. Um, uh, other, other Russian, other Russian um, um, participants of the Byzantine Institute, I tried out, I tried hard, but I was unable to trace any Byzantine education on their side. For example, Rayevsky or Yermolov, uh, the secretaries of Whittemore. Uh, or Artamonov, who was the photographer, the staff photographer of the Byzantine Institute. All of them were Russians for sure. They were white Russians. But whether or not they had any special Byzantine training, I was unable to find. Probably not. Probably it was Whittemore who, who well, lured them somehow uh, 
seduced them with, with Byzantium, whereas beforehand they did not believe. It was a different story. Believe he got he he became thrilled with Byzantium while he was uh, a poor laborer in in Istanbul. Chris, you had a question. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, nobody else had a question. I was struck by what you were saying about um, the. Um, but the new emphasis on culture and uh, the uh, divergence from previous allotments of Russians kind of cast out of it. I want to go back to the third world idea and ask precisely what you were saying about that and whether or not um, this new uh, understanding of Constantinople that comes out of this you know, white immigration and this new, I guess, what you're saying, an academic focus and, mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of a cultural. Uh, and the scholarly understanding, if it produces any new narratives of the relationship between Byzantium and Russia, mm -hmm. um, that either self consciously uh, sort of attempt to deconstruct the third row idea, or they just sort of ignore it, that the third row mm -hmm. idea just sort of not play a role in these new scholarly mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, investigations, or do they come up with something to sort of to replace it, some sort of new, I don't know, relationship of. Mm -hmm. uh, no historical what osmosis or interaction synergy um, mm -hmm. is there anything there that could be used to sort of self-consciously um you know oppose the third mm -hmm. world idea sort of a destiny and a teleology mm -hmm. i would say that the concept moscow third room is one of the most overestimated concepts in the history of uh of uh, russian ideology in general so uh, it was devised by a monk, uh, very, it's very well known, who was living in a monastery on the outskirts of Pskov. Uh, several decades, two decades before uh, he wrote this, uh, Pskov was deprived of its autonomy by Moscow and the, the Republican Bell, bell of the of Vietje, yeah, of the uh, of the assembly of, of citizens of, of the Republic of Pskov was brought to Moscow, was exiled to Moscow from Pskov, and uh, the chronicler of Pskov, Pskovian chronicle chronicle says that uh, only new newly born children did not cry at this moment, so. Um, so the place of these three sentences, it's exactly not more than three sentences about Third Rome. These three sentences repeated uh, in two different writings uh, have nothing to do with the main plot of this text. Um, one uh, is against uh, astrology, uh, another is against uh, homosexualism. So they are not about this theory in general. There, there is no theory behind it. It's just, just in a declaration. This declaration probably had an inner message that although we resent our Pskovian autonomy, we are now uh, we are now entangled in the bigger world of uh, the Moscovite messianic idea. But nobody bought it. Nobody got interested in this text when they were written at the, at the beginning of the 16th century. Nobody was really interested. It was used by Boris Godunov at the end of the 16th century when he needed some support for his political desire to have the Patriarchate of Moscow independent from Constantinople. So he used this formula where the Third Rome as a battle cry in his well relations with Constantinople. But after, after Moscow became Patriarchate in 1589, everybody forgot about this slogan, except the old believers. So these texts were copied exclusively in the circles of old believers. The main, well, the main 
mainstream of the Russian culture did not remember about it. Nobody, nobody paid 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 any any attention to it. So it was absolutely not known to anybody in Russia until these texts were finally published by scholars in the begin in, in in the uh, in the mid nineteenth century, and these publications, absolutely scholarly publications, all of a sudden they perfectly fit with the rise of the Russian imperialism on the eve of the Crimean War. Uh, it was the 400th anniversary of the fall of Constantinople, and there were first aspirations that now we will finally conquer Constantinople. And that's how the Russian uh, Moscow Third Rome began its new life. So it lives for all practical purposes since since the, 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 the mid 19th century. So afterwards, after this date, all Russians and probably everybody around the world know that, well, Moscow is the third Rome. Although by the way, in the 16th century, it was not the city of Moscow, but it was the, the princedom of Moscow, of course, it was the, the state, uh, not the city. But anyway, so, it was messianic at the beginning, yeah? Nobody, I don't know why nobody is interested, why they speak about Third Rome, not Second Constantinople. Why at all to be interested in Rome, in Italian Rome? Who, who thinks about it and what for? Because it's not about politics, it's about eschatology of the, the end of the times. So, uh, Rome is just moving from the from the initial point to the final point, and final point is Moscow. It becomes from Messianic, it 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 develops into an imperialistic, into imperialistic concept by the end of the 19th century, and since then it lives as an as an imperialistic slogan, uh, which was of course very popular during the First World War. Um, then forgotten and sort of damned by by the Russians who thought that it was probably the the false concept we get to begin with and it led to the ruin of our Russian Empire and then again it was revitalized by comrade Stalin at the in mid 40 in mid the mid 40s strange as it may seem it was the the communists who uh, who who uh, somehow uh, re 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 reinstated this as a as a as a slogan, and since then it it lives in a sort of re 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 reinvigorated life. So it's a it's a tricky story. So are any alternative relations imagined in the new scholarship that comes out of the white Russian immigration here? My question is about the white Russian immigration in particular in 1920. Are any alternative relations between Byzantium and uh, Russia or between Constantinople and Russia? Oh, uh, the, the new scholarship that you know, these people begin. Yes, yes, they, they yes, they got interested. Uh, it, there were lots, lots of new, new different ideas. To, for example, take the name of um, Fyodor uh, Schmidt, whom I mentioned, uh, who was uh, the first researcher of Kariya Jami. Uh, he was an avant-gardist scholar. He was not an immigrant, but he, uh, he, he, he was very avant-gardist scholar. By then it was, it didn't, it made no, no difference. He was in contact, in constant, uh, well, uh, mutually, I think, beneficial con uh, contacts with, with uh, uh, emig his immigrant colleagues. Um, so he was saying that probably uh, let let us look at Byzantium as a part of general East of of Oriental culture. So don't forget about thinking that it's Rome at all. It's not Roman culture. It's East. It's uh, look. There is there is a lot of uh, a lot of similarities between Indian, Persian, Persian, Ottoman cultures and Byzantine cultures. So let's develop this uh, Eastern openings. It was interesting. I, I don't believe him, but by then it was quite revolutionary for, for Byzantine studies. Um, uh, they were 
um, uh, they were trying, many of white Russians were of course also uh, imbued with socialist ideas. So that's why they, they were saying, let's, let's develop the class, class approach to, to Byzantine studies. Let's, let's develop the uh, agricultural history of Byzantium. Let's, let's find, uh, find the class struggle between, uh, between the, the um, serfs and the, the landowners. And so, so yes, uh, there, was, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of interesting uh, th things going on in Byzantine studies in, at the beginning of the 20th century. Both in in the in the Soviet Russia and and in immigration, in this respect they were it was being done by by the same more or less well people from from the same milieu they understood each other. There's one uh, question from our online audience from Yanis Tiligakis. Спасибо uh, большое. I wanted to know what did Constantinople how did Constantinople what did Constantinople get for giving Moscow patriarchate status in 1589? Uh, and I think that on this question, we will end because we're really going on for a long time. So, yeah. Quick yeah, quick answer is that the patriarch uh, of Constantinople was uh, deprived by the Ottoman Sultan of his abode in Constantinople. He was homeless. And he came to Moscow to to ask for money to to build a, a new church for himself. And um, if Boris Godunov, being a political genius, he said, "You know, maybe it's dangerous to to stay in Constantinople. You know, Ottomans can kill you any moment. Maybe you want to become." patriarch of moscow it's much more much more comfortable to stay here and absolutely safe he said of course he said yes i want to become a patriarch of moscow but he said unfortunately there is no patriarch of moscow so please give permission to organize the patriarch of moscow and he did but as soon as he signed the document and said so where i'm going to be staying who asked Boris Godunov, you? Why you? We have our own candidate. So he, yeah, he was fooled. He was fooled by Boris Godunov. That's that's what so he didn't get any. Uh, no, I mean, he, he got some he got some some uh, fur, 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 uh, fur coats. Yeah, he was also uh, invariably they were getting furs from from the Tsar. So, and he and he built his church where exactly where now Patriarchate is house, house uh, St. George Church is was erected um, afterwards, but nothing of the Moscow is Patriarchate. Well, thank you very much. And I uh, think that the audience is very pleased with the response.